At Baker's, shopping with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store. Same low prices, deals, and rewards on the same high-quality items. It's one small click for groceries, one big win for busy families everywhere. Start your cart today at bakersplus.com. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Ich warte seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäb's sein Lied. Was mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht, komm dir entgegen. Hallo und willkommen zu Gegenpressing, der Bundesliga-Podcast. I'm Manu Feit, hier ist Stefan Bienkowski. Stefan, this is going to be a very, very quick one, just, you know, our usual Monday, uh, Monday show. But because there is no actual football to discuss other than the Germany game, we're trying to keep this as brief as possible. Um, but before we dive into all of that, How's it going? How are you doing? How's your week been? Yeah, I've been very well. Uh, international football brings with it, you know, opportunities to kind of focus on other things. I got a, a few books finished. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, lots of other things. Scotland have qualified for the Euros, which I'm absolutely Congrats. ecstatic about. Uh, already trying to plot out how I'm going to stay in Germany next year, along with probably another 20,000 Scots. Um I've been following a few threads on like Reddit and Twitter and things, and people have just it's it's kind of terrifying the, the the kind of things that people are talking about. I saw one guy suggesting that they should bunk in, they should get somewhere outside Gelsenkirchen because that's got good travel routes to Frankfurt and Munich. And I just kind of thought these guys just do not appreciate how big Germany is, uh, or over accentuate or overstate how good the trains can be at the best of times. Uh. Uh, but yeah, that's been my weekend mostly. And of course, like you said, Germany as well um, against the United States. So yeah, it's been a good weekend. How about you? Yeah, good. Uh, enjoyed my week off, final day off, uh, technically flying back to the West Coast today from Montreal. Um, this is going to be a brief show. So anyone asking for travel advice, please do do it <laughs> underneath the, the, the podcast when it's published. I will try to answer it there. Because I don't think we have enough time to to go through all over all, all over my recommendations of the La Belle Province, uh, as they call Quebec in Canada. But yeah. um, it's been a good week. It's been just nice being offline. Yeah, I was speaking to one of our colleagues recently about you, and the basically I said was that Manu, more often than not, you can assume he's probably on a plane somewhere because it just feels like you crisscross that continent on a weekly basis. Yeah. Yeah, I, I ticked off another box. I've never been uh, east of Ontario, so that's done. <laughs> Quebec is on the checklist. <laughs> My map of North America is slowly but surely all getting penciled in. <laughs> but um, enough of that. We, we have Germany discuss who are actually in North America, so we should probably do that um, right after this break. This episode of the Gegenpressing Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Football is back. And Bet Online is your number one information source for all your sports wagering info with all the up to minute stats, news, scores, and matchup breakdowns. Get the latest game odds, spreads, and totals from the NFL and college football at your fingertips with Bet Online's real time updates on statistics, news, and odds. From week one all the way to college football playoff and Super Bowl, Bet Online gives you access to best football promotions and contests available anywhere online. Head to the website today or use all your mobile device to get in on the action. Remember to use our promo code BELIEVE, that is B-L-E-A-V, BELIEVE, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, Stefan, as I said, very brief. Um, I think we will do a special this week on Germany's first two games under Nagelsmann, right? So yeah. for a bigger dive into this issue, we want to wait to Mexico game, but I do think we own it to our listeners, especially because we have so many listeners from the United States um, to talk about this U.S. game. And um, 
I described it as a positive first step against a team that, how am I going to say this politely, Stefan? It, they're, they're a big team in CONCACAF, but probably a middle-class team in, in Europe, right? So what we saw from this Germany team is good because so many times in the previous era, they seem to, especially against teams like that, underperform. Yeah. And so getting this, this, getting this result um, is, is very, very positive in that regard, especially after going 1-0 down. But I think both of us want to see um, Nagelsmann play, do play this kind of football and see what he actually does once we get closer to Euros when he plays against the big European countries. And that is sort of my summary from what I've taken away from seeing the highlights and seeing uh, some of the extended highlights and seeing, you know, watching the game really briefly, um, watching it back. I just feel, I just feel this was a really good step, but nothing more and nothing less. Yeah, it was, it was basically a free hit for Nagels when it wasn't to, in these kind of yeah. situations. You can't really do anything wrong to an extent because it's a, I mean, it's a friendly first and foremost, but it's also the first game. So, you know, everything kind of gets chalked up as a work in progress. But yeah, I completely agree. It was encouraging. Um, I completely agree with you that if you kind of look back over Flick's time briefly as the, you know, the Bundes trainer, um, you know, his team's, kind of bizarrely actually tend to do quite well in the big games so you know you can kind of go back to that Nations League run where you know they were picking up good points against England and Italy routinely but Mm -hmm. then trip up against Hungary uh, the World Cup group where you know they go toe to toe with Spain and do very well but Japan managed to kind of you know knock them over and then obviously most recently um you know, the kind of string of kind of poor performances and these kind of friendlies only for the team to actually do quite well against France. And I think, I mean, obviously international football is so sporadic in terms of its scheduling that it's hard to kind of draw correlations between, you know, one set of games to the next. But it kind of felt a bit like uh, when you watch a team in domestic football and... You know, they struggle to put together coherent performances against teams they should beat, but when they play against a giant, they tend to play well. And the perceived wisdom there is, oh, wow, you know, they've got really... It's really impressive that they managed to take points off the team top of the table, but actually, more often than not, the players themselves, uh, you know, professional footballers, when they play against bigger teams or play in big stadiums or on big stages, they usually don't really need any encouragement to... Uh, you know, to perform because it's what they want to do anyway. The coaching and where the best coaches in the world earn their wages is when they can convince these players to put in those kind of performances against the minnows and find ways to break down teams that will sit defensively against them. And I think that's something that Nagelsmann um, probably feels quite strongly about. You know, when you listen to him talk about his style of coaching and his career to date, he always says that at least half the job, if not more, is about trying to get the players on board, to get the players to buy into his tactics, his system. It's not so much that, you know, he's the best tactician in the world or that, you know, his training methods turn players into superstars. It's the fact that he has to be able to convince the players that what he's doing works and that they buy into it. And that's when you kind of see that transformed into good performances in the games that they're expected to win. And yeah. As you said, you know, the United States, with all the respect, probably a second tier nation. And by that, I mean, they're not a top tier nation. So, you know, there's multiple tiers going all the way down to, you know, Luxembourg or what have you. Um, but they are probably the caliber of opponent that a Germany in recent years would have struggled against in competitive yeah. games. Especially um, after going down. Yes, exactly. And... So, you know, even before we kind of dive into, you know, performances from certain players or tactics, I think that itself is quite impressive. Don't want to read too much into it, obviously, because they are just friendlies. And, you know, as you we talked about... bounce as well, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, but it's, it is it is fascinating. I mean, what, what did you make of the tactics and the players that he picked? And, you know, did anyone really stand out to you in that regard? I actually really liked the players he picked. Um, there was a lot made that this is like the oldest Germany team in decades right um especially for like a debut game um 
but I actually thought, you know, one of the things that I wrote about when Nagelsmann got picked was the need of pragmatism with this Germany team. He goes out, he picks Hummels, right? Um, which makes total sense in my opinion because he has the experience, but he's also been playing well lately. So yes, pick the players in form, and he did. Um, I really like that he stuck to Pascal Gross. I wrote about him when he first got selected by Hansi Flick, and I wrote in that article that Pascal Gross was probably picked by the national team three years too late, and he had an outstanding game. Um, I thought it was really neat that instead of, you know, the, the reflect by Han reflects by Hansi Flick would have been, oh, Joshua Kimmich is out, so I'm getting your pick Goretzka to play next to uh, Gundogan, which is a terrible, you know, terrible combination. And Nagelsmann is like, no, I'm I'm going to play the, the player who is best suited to play next to Gundogan, who is Pascal Gross, and I'm going to start him over Goretzka. And guess what? It worked, right? And um, those are sort of the pragmatic solutions I wanted to see. I really like the combination of Musiala and uh, Fulkrug up top, right? The two combined for two goals. Um, Fulkrug, I thought, actually had an outstanding game. And I think... He's probably nailed down that number one, that number nine position for the Euros, um, because he's just there at the right place at the right time, and he really combines quite well with the the players around him. Um, and I actually also thought that Leroy Sané was quite active too. He's really carrying that form, that Bayern form, to the national team as well. And so those are the things that kind of stood out to me. Um, I think the defense is still a work in progress, you know, but I think Nagelsmann in game, and this is where he's really good at, he kind of drew the right conclusion and moved the team backwards, right? Where Flick would have said, no, like I'm going to stick to my high press, my high defensive line. You could see that Nagelsmann is, even though they were down a goal, he said, no, like, you know, we need more stability. So he moved the entire squad back. And I thought that was, that was really telling as well. And it's just kind of shows you that the man management seems to play a bigger role as well. So those were a few things that really stood out to me. But like for me, you know, there's a couple guys that were the big winners, and that's Musiala, Phil Krug, and Pascal Kroos. I think those three from that first game will probably look back and say, hey, uh, we'll play a really big role for that Euro squad. Yeah. I thought um, David Hall, one of our subscribers, mentioned in the chat during the game, he had a really good point about Jonathan Ta started at right back and how it's kind of similar to the way that Benjamin Pavard played for Bayern under Nagelsmann where uh, he played with a very out and out left back in Gozens and I was quite surprised he started Gozens because I thought he's had a very kind of shaky start at Union Berlin to be honest with you uh, and he had David Raum on the bench who could have obviously played and he could have played Hoffman at right back which obviously Hansi Flick had done in the past but you know, he stuck with that and it kind of went to a back three and allowed Gozens to kind of get forward. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was involved in one of the goals directly, actually. Yes. Uh, the um, Musiala goal. The, the, the yeah. Fulgur goal. The Fulgur goal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think, as you said, like pragmatism is probably the word of uh, the, the buzzword there because, you know, instead of kind of maybe opting for a team that's meant to suggest that he's putting together a long term plan that will maybe you know, ripe in, in two or three years' time, uh, he's just decided, no, I'm going to pick a team that's, that has to win this football game, you know, and that's obviously why we've seen the likes of Hummels come back in alongside Rudiger, uh, Jonathan Taz, a kind of no-nonsense right back so they can accommodate Gozins, you know, also not a spring chicken anymore either. Ikai Gundgen, who, you know, for times maybe some suggestions as to when he was going to hang up his boots for Germany, um alongside someone like Gross, who, as you mentioned, is maybe not the most kind of like, you know, maybe not the sexiest or the most kind of, you know, um, and it's not a household name, shall we say. Um, yeah, but he's the most productive player in the Premier League behind only Kevin De Bruyne over the last four years. No, no, I know. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he definitely has his plot. I just mean in terms of the German national team, as you said, you know, he's, he's been a long time coming. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, obviously, that, you know, When's the last time we saw Jeremy play without Kimmich or uh, Gretzka in the middle of the park? Um, so that's that's an interesting one. Um, and yeah, and and and, and Phil Krug's probably the be perfect example of that, isn't it? Where, you know, maybe someone like Flick who was given the, um, you know, given the, I'm trying to think of the right words, the responsibility of being a long-term succession plan to Joachim Lowe 
maybe might have thought, mm, right, I need to kind of think of some long-term plans. And that's why he was maybe kind of, you know, maybe I play Kai Havertz here and then, Jamal, uh-huh. and then you know, Jamal Musiala can slot in here. Maybe this is where Julian Brandt can play off him. Where he was trying to overthink things to maybe try and put together some long-term plan, Nagelsmann says, no, I'm going to play a number nine and I'm going to play three extreme, extremely good attack midfielders off him and see what happens. And, you know, there's still issues with that defence. I still think, you know, uh, as David points out, you know, Ta, Mats Hummels and Rudiger um, looks absolutely petrifying against a good counter-attacking team. But I think yeah. the thing that really stood out to me was actually in the, in the lead-up to that Gundogan goal where Leroy Sané kind of goes on that run. Yeah. You see from a certain angle in the replay, you see both Musiala and Florian Wurtz making almost parallel runs into the box like alongside each other and you know we see Phil Krug offering himself as a kind of uh, player to play off which he does I don't actually think it was good to get he played off actually but yeah. it just feels very straightforward it feels very kind of you know things aren't overthought and yeah and, and, and the way and, and this is maybe the chased best... that ball as well that was like it was it was just all directness right like Sonny crashes the box and they, you, if you draw the lines every player where in the past there would have been like a more kind of static attack, you can almost draw lines where you see all the players like going, moving directly into the box, trying to make use of that space that was created that way. Um, which is, you know, and we've, we've lamented this against, especially the weaker positions, how Germany tends to underperform the XG, right? Um, and maybe Nagelsmann has finally found a solution there by just telling his players to be direct. Yeah. yeah. I think before we maybe wrap this up on Jeremy, why don't you kind of fill listeners in who maybe aren't from like from North America, what Germany will face in Mexico? Do you think they're a better team than US, a different type of team, or do you think it'll be quite similar? I think it's going to be quite similar, to be honest. I mean, Mexico as a team uh, in CONCACAF, they, ha- they, they have struggled, right, uh, in, in recent years, and um, their federation has gone through a ton of change. Um, they finished that the last World Cup qualification cycle, which is like a league table similar to South America, right? It's um, it's the it used to be called the hexagon. Now it's the octagonal, right? Because it's eight teams. Um, when they finished that um, third, I believe, if I remember correctly, Canada finished first, and then the U.S. and Mexico kind of finished behind them. Um, it's going to be a really similar team to the U.S., to be honest with you. They have a striker up front in Santiago Gimenez, who's um, who's in form, right? Um, a lot of teams in the Premier League want him at the moment. So that's going to be a really good test for that back line. But to be honest with you, I actually think this U.S. team is probably better. Um, and I think that Germany should comfortably beat Mexico when if they play the way they played against U.S. The, the thing that I think needs to be added is they're playing this game in Philadelphia at a much bigger facility because you know Mexican fans tend to make every game in the United States a home game so there will be 60,000 Mexican fans there uh, which is just bonkers right the atmosphere is going to be absolutely crazy so I actually think that makes it worth watching to be honest with you because it's going to be a great atmosphere and a great facility Um, yeah uh, but I think ultimately they should beat Mexico Um, if they play the way they do. And I think that would leave Nagelsmann in a really good position. Actually, you know, maybe before we wrap this up completely, there was a lot of complaining. And I think we will discuss this on the bonus show, right, once we watch the Mexico game. But there was a lot of complaining about Germany going to the U.S. and um, doing this long trip. I actually think this will benefit Nagelsmann because being able to put the team away in a a camp-like situation and work with them for like a good 10 days away from Germany I think that will actually help him. But we'll discuss this more after the, the Mexico game, I think, when we have some more impressions when do it on the bonus show. I think um, for for now, this is probably enough because we want to really quickly touch on the new, the Augsburg news, right? Um, Marston gone. You wrote it in the Monday newsletter. Uh, yes, Turup comes in. I'm intrigued by this hiring, Stefan. Yes, Turup is a coach with a really strong resume. Um, and it's not someone I expected to sign at FT Augsburg. Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, as you said, I wrote a kind of blurb in the Monday show because I wanted to make a point of it just because 
we just didn't get a chance to talk about uh, Masson getting sacked last week for one reason or another. Largely, as you said, you were away and we had guests on, so we kind of did specific topics. Um, and it's also kind of flew under the radar a wee bit, but obviously it bounced back because they've signed a new head coach now. And I guess the kind of gist of my point in the newsletter was that, you know, obviously people will probably, you know, look at, um, you know, They'll probably maybe look at the league table and they'll think, right, okay, we're seven games in. Augsburg are one point above Bochum in 15th place. Um, You know, it maybe it makes perfect sense that they sack their head coach. My only... I mean, obviously, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think when you actually kind of dig into the details, it becomes a little less clear why they actually have sacked him. You know, I think he... He actually, um, I think Kicker had a, you know, had a response from him after he got sacked, and he said he was disappointed. And I can kind of see why, because, you know, I think Augsburg have actually had a really tricky start to the season. Um, they've played, uh, they've already played Bayern, they've already played Leipzig, they've already played Freiburg. Um, you know, they've had Gladbach and Bochum as well, and they've picked up points there. They then beat Mainz, but it was that kind of two-one defeat to Darmstadt, which obviously ultimately left a mass and losing his job and I think if you kind of go back and watch that game you'll realise that you know Augsburg were okay in terms of their performance but the first goal came from a really ridiculous kind of volley left-footed volley that just kind of flew into the net after a shot like a spectacular long shot that hit off the post and then the rebound which is just one of those shots that you could hit a hundred times and it would only go yeah. in once uh, and then a penalty which I think was maybe the second or third penalty they've conceded in the last couple of games um and, you know, I, I just, so I mean, yeah, they were unlucky in that game, but I think if you look over the stretch of their first seven games, I don't think there's a huge amount there to suggest that they needed to sack their head coach, other than the fact that you could say they've only picked up one win from seven. But, I mean, we're talking about Augsburg here, we're not talking about Borussia Dortmund or, you know, Leipzig. We're talking about a team who, who's very, you know, reputation in the Bundesliga has revolved around avoiding relegation by the skin of their teeth and one thing I think is really worth interesting, uh, is worth mentioning which I think is really interesting is that um, the expected goals against so far this season um, is 9.26 um, which is the 5th best in the division and I think I'm right in saying they're open play XG so basically when you kind of take penalties and free kicks out there, I think it's actually the third best in the division. So they were putting up decent performances and, you know, doing well to defend, but just for one reason or not, it wasn't working. It just, I think the way I just kind of worded it in the newsletter was that it was kind of unlucky that Masson just simply was unfortunate. But, you know, I, I kind of, you know, you mentioned Toro there, that he's, he's obviously picked up a good reputation in Danish football for doing well, but, I do kind of wonder if he's going to look at this team and look at the underlying numbers and think, is there actually anything I can do to improve this team? Because they were doing okay. It's just a bit of misfortune wasn't going their way. Yeah, and he he would be the sort of coach to look at that, right? Because like of his his past, um, he was at um, he was at Midtjylland, which is a team that's that's known for looking at underlying numbers, right? Um, that he was against, he was gang Copenhagen, another Danish team where like. There's a very big emphasis on on numbers and um, underlying stats and data, and um, it's an interesting. I find it really fascinating hire because it's it's not one that I expected Augsburg to make, if that makes sense. Um, but I mean, you look at who is involved in this team, right? There's David S. Blitzer in the background, who's an American. Um, he's involved with uh, Real Salt Lake and, and Major League Soccer where um, they have done a lot of data work in the background as well. So I almost wonder if, you know, Augsburg is such a weird club because it's very difficult to penetrate and report on because of the the ownership structure is, uh, how am I going to say this politely? It's not quite transparent, right? And so it's really hard to, to understand how decisions are made. Like the two of us are still baffled by the whole Ricardo Pepe disaster, right? Um, which to this day doesn't make much sense. And you almost wonder if there is a little bit of that involved here, that it was essentially ownership that 
kind of pulled the trigger here because yes tour was available and he kind of fit the bill of some of the people involved in the decision making process um have he said all that i i'm curious to see how we'll do in the bundesliga i mean he might bring some new ideas and uh, ideas to this club that could serve them well yeah i mean you obviously hope you obviously hope for the best and you wish him well um yeah it's also quite interesting if you kind of look at the fixtures they've got coming up it is already very kind of sink or swim for him because they've got Heidenheim away uh, as his first game this weekend and you know Heidenheim have proved already this season that they're no pushovers and you'd think they would go into that game thinking right we, we should really be picking up three points here they then got Wolfsburg who uh, at home who are obviously doing very well this season clone away another game where he'd be expected to probably pick up three points there but might not because you know Clone have been terrible so far then yeah. Hoffenheim then Union Berlin uh, so in his first five games there he's got three opponents who they probably shouldn't beat and he's got two opponents who on paper they should be beating but might not and you kind of wonder if after those first five games if they haven't picked up the points that they wanted whether you know these kind of as you said these kind of mysterious owners might be looking back thinking hmm did it make did we really even have to change the head coach is that the issue here um, but look that's that's just Augsburg for you. This is them weekend or season in season out, isn't it? Where they, um, it it feels like they're just kind of winging it, and then you know, um, some January fifteenth. <laughs> yeah, well, it, about January or February every year, they kind of pull together like six or seven decent results, yeah. and that's enough for them. Um, yeah. But I don't know. It'd be an interesting thing to watch because, you know, we kind of talked about this on the kind of bonus show, Matt and I, in terms of the two teams who could go down and be in real trouble, and those are obviously Mainz and Cologne. But if Heidenheim continue the form that they're in, and Darmstadt haven't been exactly poor either, they've picked up two wins in the bounce. The two of them moving into mid-table very quickly makes a number of those mid-table teams very nervous because they don't, you know, in the last kind of couple of seasons, or God, you can go back five or six seasons, there's always been at least one or two you know, for lack of a better term, cannon fodder teams in the Bundesliga where they get promoted, you know, you wish them all the best, but they just aren't good enough. And so far, Heidenheim and Darmstadt have proved that they're not going to be those sides. So that's what's made the likes of Mainz and Cologne and Bochum very nervous. And now probably why Augsburg have decided to kind of pull the trigger and, and try to shake things off. Mm. It's, it's a really interesting point because, as you said, like we expected those two teams to be not good, and now they are, right? They're overperforming and... If you are Mainz, Köln, Augsburg, Bochum, that will, yeah, that's a really good point. I think those teams, all of a sudden, that puts pressure on you where you thought, okay, this is going to be an easy season. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's not, right? Yeah. And so the decision-making becomes maybe more rapid, but also could lead to more mistakes, which yeah. is also fascinating. So definitely one to keep an eye on. Uh, I know, Stefan, you have to wrap it up pretty quick because you all do another show. Um, but as always, this podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. And yes, um, as we get closer to the Bundesliga match day, we'll have, of course, the regular content come out. The preview show will be back this week. Uh, bonus show, we're going to dive, do a bigger dive into the, uh, the, the new Nagelsmann era. And of course, the, the transfer show that's all coming um, later this week and our newsletters. And the Monday bulletin is out as well. So check that out as well. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap this up, Stefan? No, I think you were quite comprehensive there. Got it all yeah. got it all out. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. We'll be back soon. Until then, auf Wiedersehen. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.